Thank you very much indeed. Great to be here. Thanks for the invitation to come. <coughs> yes, well, a layman's guide. <coughs> Peter's been saying this morning, oh, Peter will answer that. Peter will answer that. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I'm going back to 1550. I'm going back to 1550 to this gentleman here whose name was Georgius Agricola. And you can see his dates there, 1494 to 1455. He wrote a book called De Re Metallica. And uh, it's a hugely important book from the point of view of mining of all kinds, not just military mining, but particularly mining for ores and coals and what have you. <coughs> it's especially important because what he did was list what was going on at that time. We were in the Dark Ages in Britain in the 16th century. Mining was in a dreadful state. We hadn't got the technology, we hadn't, which is rather strange, really, from the point of view of... British engineering because we are so renowned for fantastic engineering, but we'd come to a standstill as regards mining in the <coughs> mid-16th century. This is where I first started my underground excavations. This is Coniston in the Lake District. <coughs> Coniston copper mines in the bottom of that valley. The whole of this mountain range is riddled with workings. Copper is what they're after there. And they reached a point where they could no longer reach this this incredibly valuable ore. What they've done is they started on the surface and cut right down through the mountains. These great deep cuts are where they've taken the ore out of the mountain. So they've gone, they've started on the surface where they could see it and just dug down and down and down and down until the air became far too bad to breathe and they couldn't get any further down. They needed some help and that's where Georgius Agricola, Agricola came in or rather his predecessors I suppose. We got he, what he was doing was listing what they did. He wrote it down. In th the book is tremendous. It was translated into English for the first time in 1906 by a future president of the United States, Herbert Hoover, and his wife, I, should, I must hasten to add. <coughs> and so, that means that the first half of my talk will have to be in Latin, if that's all right with you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing. <laughs> so, Coniston Copper Mines. This is what they look like inside. They've just taken the ore out as if you put an axe through the mountain uh, and they're almost vertical they hade slightly to one side so this is where the ore has come out on it and what they did to hold the, the walls apart was put in these stemples and on top of these stemples they put false floors so as you're going down you never know what you're standing on but this is really the birth of military mining because as you'll see the uh, the techniques which they developed or which were developed, which were passed on to the British by the Continentals, were used in the First World War, and all wars before that as well, where tunnelling was used. Here is one of the designs from Agricola's book. Timber-built shaft. This is 1540, 1550. Here's a 1912 design by the Royal Engineers. Nothing's changed mainly because nothing had to change. That's the key in military mining. And as we go on, you'll see that the, uh, that the simpler things were, the more efficiently you could do them. And although during the First World War we had a tremendous um, opportunity to use uh, technical equipment, we didn't do so for specific reasons. And the key specific reason is because these things and this thing are far more efficient than machinery. You never run out of men in an army of six million. It's difficult to find the skills, specific mining skills, but for the beasts of Burton who bring all this kind of stuff in for the miners, you never run out of those. You run out of material, but you don't run out of the men who can do it. So simplicity was the key. Here is a, this is Vampire Farm. Uh, in the Eep Salient, which Peter was talking about uh, before, and you can see how very closely timbered that is. That's to counteract the pressures of the clays which are coming in from all sides. <coughs> so this is, this is a dig we did in... I can't even remember when we did it, actually. I have no idea. Anybody know? <laughs> no. <laughs> I think it was 2010, I think it was. A tremendous 
conservation of materials. The timber was in absolutely perfect condition because of the waterlogged conditions that Peter was talking about. Same as the Mary Rose. Exactly the same thing applies. You don't get that when you move on elsewhere. And this is where we're working at the moment. Lavoiselle, this is W shaft. Um, and you can see how beautifully dug that is. And when you look at the, when you, if you cast your mind back to the drawings which you just saw, the, uh, the care and the, uh, the pride, I suppose, is what it is, that goes into mining. The more care you put into that joint or that piece of timber, the better timber you can use, the more you care put into it, the, the longer it is going to, to last. But more than that here, you can see here, what they've done is they dug this beautifully square shaft. Now, why did they do it so perfectly square? It's because they had pride in their work. These were professional miners, and their skills came originally from the Continentals, who came to teach them in the 1500s. I'll give you some more examples. Here's the way in. The entrances to mines haven't changed a great deal. You don't make them any bigger than you need to because this rock is bloody hard. So there's the entrance to the deep level on the left-hand side into Coniston Copper Mines, which leads you onto kilometres of uh, mine workings. And if they weren't flooded, you could go down below the surface level of Coniston Lake. You're way up above it here. And it goes throughout the mountains. Uh, tremendous uh, experience. If you ever get the chance to go in there with somebody, go in and have a look. Quite breathtaking. The, the effort that human beings put in to making a living is astonishing. And Coniston there, where Peter was talking about the, um, uh, the flint ringing. It doesn't matter where you hit this rock, it rings like a bell. Incredibly hard. And here, on the right-hand side, is a lovely picture given to me by Richard Van Emden last week of a, a British mine entrance at Frelingen in the, in the clays of French Flanders. And I don't think you can read it, but up, yeah, up there is the, the entrance to a dugout with a name board over it, and it says, Some Swank. That's the name of the... <coughs> you can always find something funny in these things. There's the entrance to Coniston. Uh, this was dug in the 19th century. This was the deepest level. And you can see the remains of the railway down the bottom and water flowing through it because these mines are always making water. They're all connected throughout the mountainside. And, of course, that's exactly what you had on the Western Front. Uh, you dig a hole in the ground. where It doesn't matter where you dig a hole. Water will find its way into it, whether it's in clay or chalk, that it's natural to percolate towards that hole. So you have to deal with the water, another really key aspect of military mining. Here's our tunnel at La Boiselle. This is the W Adit, which leads down to W Shaft, which is the only shaft which we presently have open there. Um, hopefully in the future we'll be open, we may be able to open more, but uh, there are lots of landowners, uh, which makes it quite difficult, because some people are happy to, for you to dig a hole on their ground, other people definitely are not. There are many people on the Western Front uh, who live there who have absolutely no interest in the war at all which is, uh, always comes as a surprise to somebody as passionate as me, but there you are. You have to deal with that and accept it. Agricola also showed how you get into these mines. The entrances I've just showed you are fairly straightforward. You walk in. Here in the 1500s, you're using ladders over here. You're going down on a winch, just a piece of wood which you sit on and you wound down, which was not, a, not at all uncommon. First of all, you actually slide down on a rope, down a, a steep incline, and, or you've got steps coming down. Now, we've seen all these except for this particular one here, <laughs> which uh, would have been too difficult, obviously, because you've got to get out as well as get in. And military mining is very, very different to civilian. <clears throat> that is what's called a coffin level. And you can see by the shape of it, this is, this is 16th century British mining. And here, it, oh, that's a long, taking a long time. That's our 80-foot level at La Boiselle. You can see there are a certain, the height is very similar. The scale of it is different because they need, as Peter was saying, they need to do different things in these tunnels than they do in those. This is purely access to go from one vein to another and also to create a flow through of air, a circulation of air. That's, that was the key. In order to get deeper, you had to have air. You couldn't pump it down there. Um, to the deeper levels, so you had to create a natural system to supply air 
wherever you went, the deeper you went, if you could supply a natural flow, that was much better than pumping it. <coughs> that is, in fact, how the tunnelers saw the 80-foot level at La Voiselle, not as we saw it there with our uh, bright LED lights, but by candlelight. And it's interesting, when we did this little experiment and put candles, you can actually see where the, where the candles were down the walls because the, the smut marks were there. So we replaced them as close as we possibly could without damaging the archaeology. And that is the colour which they would have seen. It actually made it somewhat magical. Uh, and although you knew that that was one of the most barbaric battlefields on the Western Front, and all around you down there, you also know that there are men still lying who lost their lives in that underground clash. But it, it changed, when you candlelight it, it changes the atmosphere and it changes your perceptions almost instantly because you're going from pool of light to pool of light to pool of light. You're not in a, in a permanently floodlit gallery. Tremendous. And everything was done by candlelight. It was dug by candlelight, timbered by candlelight, railways were put in by candlelight, chambers by candlelight, mines blown by candlelight. All those tiny things which they had to deal with, all by candlelight. Remarkable achievement, but by necessity, of course. Candlelight, there we are. The one thing I'd never seen, although we found in Flanders lots of little stubs of wax candles, was a whole First World War candle. And there is one which we found at the top of W shaft, a little packet of them, actually. And next to it, there was a short miner's pick, very short, about that big, and a tin of water still with the water in it, a petrol tin still with the water in it. And in those three things, you have everything you need to go military mining, apart from a packet of sandwiches. Light to work by, water to drink, and the tools to use. Everything else is inbuilt. You've got the skills already. You don't need a uniform. You don't even need boots. You don't need a rifle. You don't need a helmet. You need none of those military accoutrements at all to be a military miner. All you need is the skills you come with, water, light, something to eat, and whatever the other thing was, which I don't know for. Tools, that's definitely quite important, the tools, yeah. <laughs> tools. <laughs> and there you have a French listener sitting in his listening post with his listening kit, a geophone like this one here. Uh, you'd be very welcome over lunchtime to test that, actually. It's quite, they're still made and used looking for water leaks. So, uh, th Simon gave me that very kindly. Thank you, Simon. <laughs> I don't think I've ever publicly thanked you for that. <laughs> so there, round of applause to Simon. <laughs> Thank you. You can buy me lunch. <laughs> I'll buy him lunch. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're going back to simplicity. There you are. 1550, windless. First World War, windless. There's nothing different at all. They are practically identical. Why? Because they work. And all you need is men there to work them. You can work them at whatever speed you want. There's very little to break down. If something does break down, you can very easily mend it. Windlasses. Tools. 1550, on your left. If you look at the spade, <laughs> the pick, the rake. 1750, same shape. All the same shape. Nothing changed because nothing needed to change. You saw this in Peter's thing. This is 1912. 1912 military, uh, manual of military mining. There's the tools they need. There are less now because we're talking about military mining as opposed to civilian mining. You need far fewer. Note the, the push pick here. That's a very important tool. And the bags made of hessian or woven wicker work. Short pick, spade, something to hold your candle. Very, very little equipment required, really. 1550. Nothing changes. It's exactly the same in, what, 350 years? Why change it if you don't need to? And again, the tools. But things started to change when mine warfare started to become different. And this is, of course, what Peter's saying. Again, it's, it's geology which did that. So you need different tools to work in clay than you do to work in chalk. And uh, we, we've been making, uh, Colin isn't here today, but one of our engineer colleagues has been um, employing a bit of our, um, what's it called? Um, yes, it's experimental archaeology uh, by making these tools according to these plans. And so we've been testing them in, in certain parts of the, uh, the workings to see 
how you use them, because it's all right seeing them on the screen or seeing even finding one, but it's actually how you hold it and what it does. That's how, and they're all designed for different, uh, different processes. Very clever stuff. Even mine trolleys. Great picture of a German mine trolley. Look how similar it is in 1916 to what it was in 1550. No need to change that. It's all up. He's got wooden wheels here, of course. Um, some of them were ruddy old whale, uh, rails at the time, wooden rails, of course. But, uh, and many British mines, La Boiselle included, use wooden rails. So nothing had changed. They'd utilised the skills and the knowledge which they'd been passed on by the Continentals in the 16th century to employ it throughout the rest of the period of, of not only civilian mining, but employing it in, in military mining as well. Wheelbarrows, even just the same. Everything is just the same. So you could actually build these today using the plants which are drawn up in 1550, and they'd work just as well, but they'd be a bit heavier than modern ones. Picking techniques, exactly the same in 1550 as they were in 1915. Uh, there's only one way to do this, in a way, uh, apart from the clay kicking, of course. And if, you want to, if you're using picking techniques, then you're going to do the same. You're going to kneel down a small gallery and hack away at the face, hewing the face, as it was called. And sometimes you even find that the 1915 miners rather resemble the, the 1550 miners, which is... Uh, it's quite remarkable. Again, why change that? This man here on the, on the right is working at Bois Grenier, a very wet mine because of the presence of shales in the clay, I think it was, wasn't it, Peter? Yeah. So it made, it was very, very wet coming through. It was dripping through the, the timbering all the time, so you got soaked. So the moment this chap here is underground, goes underground, he starts getting wet. So he's simply trying to protect himself in the same way as they did several hundred years before. Ventilation I was talking about earlier on. Well, this all came from the Continentals as well. And this is the most important thing, because the deeper you go, the more you need to concentrate on ventilation. And when you open up a gallery, you start digging down, or a shaft, by the time you've gone so far, unless you're pumping air in there, the air gets stale. The oxygen level drops, your production levels drop, and it becomes extremely dangerous. So, if you dig two shafts, or two entrances, one here, and one here, and connect it with a lateral, then you get a downcast flow of air into the lateral, and then an upcast through and up. That is, it just happens naturally. And what we found at La Boiselle is we've, got, we've actually got three entrances open, which all go to the same shaft. And from time to time, the flow of air changes. Um, and we don't actually know why that is. We'll have to speak to some expert about it, I suppose. But it'll be downcast in the morning, and then the afternoon, something will change, and that downcast will be upcast. And, of course, what you can do there is the deeper you go, as long as you've got entrances going to the surface, exactly the same rule applies. Exactly the same rule applies there. You'll still have downcast and upcast. And if you have connected galleries underground, as long as they're connected to the lateral, there will be some kind of a flow of air going through there as well. And this has been a tremendous boon to us at La Boiselle because we were very worried about what we were going to find at the 80-foot level. We only had one entrance into there, this one single shaft. So when we got down to the bottom, we had masks and oxygen gear and all kinds of things because we also didn't know what kind of gases we might meet down there. There may be methane from rotting timber, latent carbon monoxide, who knows, very low oxygen levels. But when we got down there, it's funny actually because when Gary was digging, he, as we were nearing the bottom, he said, I'm sure I can feel a, a flow of air up my trouser legs. <laughs> and that's exactly what was happening. There's a strong upcast coming up the shaft. Where it's coming from, we don't know, but there, there must be, in order to be a draft coming up that shaft, there must be other holes somewhere which are letting air down into the 80-foot system for it to come up the shaft. That's been a tremendous boon. And what we've found is that uh, wherever we go in the system we've explored so far, the oxygen readings have all been absolutely steady and stable, exactly as the oxygen supply is on the surface, exactly that. So that's wonderful. The, on, the only time it changes is when you light all those candles. So that tells us something else. It changes our perception again of what these men were working with. They were working hard down there, digging, 
pushing trolleys, lifting, winching, that kind of stuff. They're also, all their galleries are candle lit, so the oxygen levels for them must have been considerably lower. Of course, they didn't, they didn't measure it. Their measure was if a candle went out because it wouldn't burn, there wasn't enough oxygen, then there wasn't enough oxygen to work. Needs must again, necessities of warfare. Go back to 1550, this is exactly what we were taught by the Continentals. How to divert more air down your shaft so that you get a stronger flow of air through your galleries. It's exactly the, uh, what's it used, the, the techniques used today, although we use a lot more machinery, obviously, air pumping. But in the First World War, this was, this was the prime method of doing that. If you could supply it naturally, that's great. If not, you had to find some way of pumping it. And in the 1550s, they had ways of pumping it. Amazing machines, all made of timber and straps of iron, some with feathers inside. Ama quite an extraordinary, in the same book, there's a huge range of different kinds of pump air pumping machines so that you can keep productivity going underground. There is a, a view of the site at La Wasselle. You can see the entrances here to X incline. Uh, is that right? No, sorry, W incline and X incline. And off the picture over here, because I couldn't find the right picture, is the third adit. So we have three entrances all going to the same shaft, which is underneath this mound here, directly under there. So these entrances go down eventually to that shaft. <coughs> so what we have in, in living colour, if you like, is a perfect example of what the British were taught in the 16th century. There we are. Now then, <clears throat> when you have to pump, you have to pump. You don't have a choice. If you're working in a, an area where you cannot get natural ventilation, you have to pump. Did things change very much? No, they certainly did not. Why change anything that worked? 1550 bellows with a lump of rock on the top to help that bellows go down. So this man is, he's actually, he's pulling that handle down to lift the bellows up. And when he lets go of it, the rock will push it down and push the air out of the nozzle of the bellows. And there we are, here's a Royal Engineer design for 1915, exactly the same thing but with sandbags. You pull the rod down, up goes the bottom of your bellows, the sandbags will help it, help it to, to pump the air out. Remarkable really, and uh, again, this is one of the things which we've tested at Lava Cell because we actually found an air pumping chamber next to W incline. There's the entrance to the incline which goes down to W shaft, and almost at the surface, you've got a little doorway, and then this crane shaped chamber and uh, when Simon came up with the, the, the plans we found that this strange shaped chamber was strange shaped because it was the shape of a bellows. Why was it shape of a bellows? Because that's what they were using in there. So Colin made the bellows according to the 179 Tunnelling Company plans and the moment you put those bellows in there that, that the story comes alive and of course we have events which we can attach to that story but again it's 16th century technology being applied to 20th century ultra-modern warfare in a, in a way. <coughs> and yes, we come to survey now. Um, I'm not quite sure whether they did it this way in, <laughs> in the 16th century, but it doesn't matter because that's the way we're going to do it in the future. <laughs> Simon's volunteered to strip off first. <laughs> but what you can see here in the 16th century is triangulation, triangulation, triangulation uh, to get depth, to get distances, to get angles, it's all triangulation and that's precisely, whoop, don't need that bit, what they did in the First World War. This is a field level, a Royal Engineer field level based solely on triangulation. That gives you levels, it's exactly one yard long or three yards when you open it out, you've got a right angle and marked upon it are gradients, everything you need there for trench warfare and mine warfare is encapsulated in one piece of brilliant technology, one piece of brilliant survey technology. Yeah, welcome to have a look at that. Uh, these are very, very rare. I don't think the RE Museum have got one of these actually, so I'll have to give it to them. But again, it's exactly the same thing. And this has been developed from that, from these early Pythagorean um, equations, in fact. There we are, good example of that. 
everything. This is the manual of military mining again, or manual of military engineering, 1912. So all the same kind of stuff. Why change it if you don't need to? And again, transfer. How do you know you're going in the right direction? You've, you've made your decision where you need to reach with your mine gallery. You've got to go straight to it. Just use the oldest technique on Earth, which is a piece of lead on the end of a string. And as long as you have, you can follow it on from one to the other, straight down the middle of the gallery, measure either side, you know you're going in a straight line. And with this thing here, you can get the gradient upon which that gallery was built. It has to be built on a slight uphill gradient because if it makes water, then you can get the water to flow back to your shaft where it can be pumped out. And that brings me to water, which is very important indeed, as you know. Here's a First World War shaft, and what they're doing here, there's your slight gradient, one in 50 slope, down the gallery to the sump, one pump there, pumps it up halfway up the shaft to another pumping chamber, so it goes from one reservoir into another one, and then up to the top where it's pumped away today, pumped away into a drain somewhere. <coughs> you know what's coming, of course. <laughs> here we are. This is absolutely astounding technology. 16th century. All this stuff is made of timber. These are tree trunks which have been bored out with an auger to create a pipe. They can't afford metal pipes, and pipe making was very, very difficult at that time. It was easier to bore out a tree, and they're doing exactly the same thing here. Lift and force pumps. It's just a piece of wood with holes in it with a leather washer on the top, and when you pull it up, when you pull it up, it lifts the water with it. When it goes down, the, the washer opens, and the water can flow into the pipe. Lift it up, down again. And you see how many times it's been doing one, two, three, and up to the surface where it flows away, or up to this gallery, actually, and there's the drain where it's taken out. So it's exactly the same thing. We couldn't, of course, apply these things in the First World War, although they were tested. But what they found was, not only with air pumping, but also with water pumping, a, they were quite noisy, if you use machinery, and B, they broke down, and men do not break down. So if you've got people on these pumps here, you can very quickly replace those pumps if they break down, or replace, um, replace parts, usually with a pickaxe, I'm told. That's how the Royal Engineers did it. If it stopped working, hit it with a pickaxe. Uh, so easily replaced, reliable, and men are supremely reliable. Here's a, a good example, a geared winch. Right, do we need to, there are certain places where they were digging so fast that uh, the material, the spoil that was coming out of the mine needed to be lifted faster. So they developed geared winches which could lift the sandbags up more quickly than a normal windlass. <coughs> they were prone to breaking down. But there were times also in civilian mining when you, were, you hit a very rich seam of ore and you wanted to get that ore out as quickly as you could. So you developed exactly the same sort of geared principle, but based upon human, this is based upon human muscle power, of course. Here, you've got a treadmill, huge treadmill, which gives you the power to convert the energy to, this is actually for water pumping, but also they did it for, for lifting bags of ore out of the mine. And at Coniston, what actually happened there was, by, the, by using um, these continental techniques and developing them over the centuries, they got to the point at the end of the 19th century where they were able the, the ore that was coming out was almost pure copper, worth an absolute fortune. What they couldn't do, because they were now mining so deep, what they couldn't do was make a chain strong enough to lift the ore to the surface. And that is why Coniston Copper Mines is probably no longer working, because they could no longer lift it that far. They'd mined everything from the tops of the mountains right the way down below the surface of Coniston Lake, and now the chain just kept breaking and breaking and breaking. And it's, it's painful to read the accounts uh, of the men who are doing that. There's another chain manufacturer getting to make their finest possible, uh, finest possible example. No, it never worked. Never did. And the other thing which equates very strongly, in my eyes, to First World War military mining is Again, it goes back to human effort. In war, you're doing things by necessity. In civilian life, you're also doing it by necessity because you've got to have bread on the table. There is one place, um, it goes back to the f very first slide, actually, where you can go in at the top of a mountain and you abseil down and walk across those stemples, which you saw, and then you reach a gallery 
and you walk and you walk and you walk and you walk and then it just stops. And what they're doing is they're cutting from one vein of copper in the belief they will find another one running parallel. They never found it. Two generations of that same family, two fathers, two sons, two, six men, that was their entire life's work. Nothing else. Two generations. And they never found a scrap of copper. That's all they did in their entire working lives. Amazing. We are made of extraordinary stuff. Oh, we've reached the war now. <laughs> because we were expecting, or perhaps we weren't expecting, but the, the old enemy was, of course, the French. And I use this slide here, which I, I think is absolutely wonderful. 1803, French invasion plans. It's got a lot going on here, hasn't it, really? <clears throat> Here's the tunnelling bit. Through you go with your, with your infantry, with your mortars, with your artillery. With your, around here, there's a few camp followers as well. So you dig that through. At the same time, you, you uh, send your, your galleons full of soldiers across. You send <laughs> balloons across. <clears throat> and here, these are the French attacking the British, of course, at Dover. And the British are defending with, uh, with their own balloons. They're firing mortars from these ships to try to destroy the British ships. But only the French can do this. And I'm, I have such admiration for the French army because only they can make the wind blow in two directions at once. <laughs> You've got these balloons going this way and these kites carrying a man with a musket uh, going in the other direction. Now, you see, we're lucky we're not speaking French today. Yeah, but yeah, man carrying kites, what a ludicrous, ludicrous idea, isn't it? Eh? Absolutely <laughs> mad idea. Crazy. But it was tried. They thought about doing that, and if it had worked very well, and if the First World War had not turned out like that, then they, <coughs> they may well have used this method for observation. Yeah. <laughs> so, siege mining operations and practice at Chatham, which is where a lot of the, the RE practice went on. And you can see, here we are, here's your shaft, just the same, bags the same, 1877, there's your field level little mine trolley, man picking, exactly as they did in 1550. Nothing's changed at all, didn't need to. 1877, we're at war. The officers arrived, they, they, um, well, here they are, here's some officer training. They're terribly serious chaps, aren't they? <laughs> terribly serious. It was a serious business. It didn't stay serious that long when they got to the front uh, because things had to fall away when it got there. You had to survive that appalling war, the stresses in underground warfare were immense because it was 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year. So immense stresses. So there was a great deal of alcohol drunk. One of the most, uh, I think probably the most common thing on a charge sheet was drunkenness, Simon. Is that correct? Uh, Wayne, you'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll stay to the end. <laughs> uh, and of course, that was the officers. And here are the men, the men with the skills. The officers, a lot of those officers who you saw, they had mining experience, but as mine uh, engineers or mine managers came from all over the empire, but they needed these men. These were the key men. An amazing photograph, this. What, what faces and what experiences those men have already had before they came to the Western Front. I mean, you look at those guys and you, you would certainly put your life in their hands, wouldn't you? I mean, such determination on their faces. Remarkable. These are 179 men, I believe, is that right? 179 Tunneling Company. So these men would have worked at La Boiselle and through Simon's work he's found a lot of photographs of these, uh, of the men who were there. But tremendous, tremendous character. And all your skills you require are in those eyes. He knows exactly what he's got to do. He doesn't know what's coming next. He doesn't know what the next moment is going to bring. But anything you ask this man to do underground, he can do it. And we've seen this chap already, <coughs> the uh, Hawthorne Ridge Tunneler with his little pick, working in a deep gallery in, at, um, at Bowman Hamill. This is, uh, this is a study I'm doing at the moment. I found, when I found this particular quote, um, it rather surprised me. Uh, well, more than surprised me, it shocked me very deeply. This kind of thing you expect, can you all read that? 
Yeah? I'll read it out if you can't. It says, the raw, wet weather went on week after week. The chalky hillside churned up under the men's feet into a grey, gluey mud that worked its way into everything and plastered itself over everything and refused to be cleaned off, even if they had anything to clean it off with, which they hadn't. Many of the men were miners from the north, used to working in underground, underground in the warm. And here, here they were, living all the time in conditions which would have made the most weather-hardened laborers suffer. They caught pneumonia and died by the dozens. Um, when you are working underground, and we found this at Labocelle, I'm sure Dur Duran Group have as well, it's not cold down there. The temperature is stable all the time. And if you've got lots and lots of men working down there, it's very warm indeed. You are also candlelit, so that makes it even warmer. All that human effort is making... And you never see a tunneler working in anything other than a vest. And people often say, oh, it must be freezing and wet and cold. No, it wasn't. But the important thing about this quote is that it doesn't refer to working on the Western Front. This refers to men before they even went to war. Billington Hospital was full of them, so they took over a church hall and soon that was full too, and still those who could walk about were left shivering on the bare hillside. At last, somebody with a little sense came down from the war office and ordered all the troops into billets until the spring. There must have been many people up north that wondered what had gone wrong when the men they had cheered and waved away to fight the Germans got no further than a muddy hillside in the south of England. And that's... It, it's another hazard that miners had to face. This is in training, in basic training. So, again, it gives you a very fresh perception of what it was to go, to go away to war as a miner. You're used to living underground all the time in the warm. You come up, you go home, you're in the pub, whatever it is, you're always in the warm. But then you're, you have to cope, A, with the training, and B, with life on the Western Front. So a very, very harsh awakening that must have been. So one of the studies I'd like to do is to find out how many people died of what before they even got to France or Belgium. Uh, listening, yes, we've got the listening, the geophone down here. Listening, absolutely essential, because as Peter said, you don't know where the enemy are because you can't see him underground, so you have to listen for him. And we concentrate on the geophone, which, is, which was certainly the most efficient and easily handled mechanism. But of course, they were constantly looking for alternatives, and this is the place really to, to look for those. These books here are produced once or twice yearly. Uh, extracts from the Procedures of the Royal Engineer Committee. It's where things were sent, where ideas were sent to, where things were tested from. And in there, you'll find here, you see 1915, the half year, January to June 1915. You don't just find the geophone in there. <coughs> you find Mr. Mears' his detector phone. And, oh, we've got sound effects. <laughs> and a sound detector by Lieutenant Joel Fraser. And Professor Bailey's detector. Anyone? <coughs> yeah, there is another one. And sound detector at Lieutenant Day, and McLennan's, and the seismometer, and Mr. Ryan's, and Mr. Pilkington's, <laughs> and the minophone. And that's just one of a few. There's plenty more. So civilians uh, and soldiers as well could see that uh, here's a great opportunity. If they need a lot of these things, we can make some money out of this. So they're all trying to develop things as the news is released that mining is going on. Of course, the British had a very, very, very clever way, not only um, with clay kicking, where they used, which was almost silent in its application, but they developed something else. The noiseless pick, <laughs> which didn't work, <laughs> would you believe? Didn't work at all. <laughs> it was actually a form, on one of the earlier slides you saw the push pick, it was a form of push pick. So it was, it would have been noiseless if you used it very, very slowly, just picking out, it was for chalk rather than for clay. But the moment, uh, when I saw that I thought, noiseless, how the hell did that work? Anyway, it didn't. So they just stuck with the kit they had. And here we are, here is uh, the enemy. Uh, the Germans working in, in chalk with quite a long handle pick there. I don't know how on earth he was swinging that, but maybe, uh, maybe he's going to make a much bigger, uh, much bigger gallery out of it. So we were both faced with doing exactly the same thing. And as I said earlier, as you go deeper, you still use exactly the same applications. Here we are, deeper and deeper and deeper. In 1550, 1917, <coughs> at Messine, it's exactly the same thing. Uh, 
So they just applied those continental rules to what they needed to do on the Western Front. This chap was German, would you believe? He was. George is Agricola, his real name was George Bauer, George Farmer. So we are obliged to the Germans <laughs> for letting them, for giving us the, the, uh, the application to, I think we can say we won the underground war in the First World War. Very much obliged to the Germans for doing that. And you may think, well, all that's changed now. We no longer need to use those, those techniques. That's not true at all. There we are. This is taken two years ago doing the uh, crossrail, London crossrail tunnels. Exactly the same techniques because they're so reliable. They're easy to use, dead easy. Men don't break down. These guys, they're Irishmen, naturally. They know what they're doing. And all they've got, which they didn't have in the First World War, but did actually test, you can see that, is the uh, conveyor belt system. Everything else is the same except the electric light. And in fact, the Germans had electric light to work with. So if you took, if you took those guys, if you took their helmets off and took off their high-vis jackets and moved this thing out of the way, you're looking at 1916. Thanks very much. Like Maloney wants to marry me and so Leave the strand and pick a dilly Or you'll be to blame For love has fairly drove me silly Hoping you're the same It's a long way to Tipperary It's a long way to go It's a long way to Tipperary